and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for coming out this evening. This is the third and final uh, presentation in our series on Cherry Hill. And I promised you, I think, a week ago that the first two presentations would make you think that we weren't talking about the same thing at all. Uh, I promise you that the third uh, will again do the same sort of thing. Because what we talked about, of course, in the, in the first lecture, Heather Broadbent was, was the whole issue of family, and she looked at it from the standpoint of the Silverthorne family in England and in the rest of Peel, I guess, once they got to Peel, she didn't concentrate on Cherry Hill as much as she did how the family branched out into the other areas. Of course, last week, Dr. Mary Crawford spoke about are the archaeology involved in all of this. And our speaker tonight is Kathleen Hicks. And Kathleen's been here for the two previous presentations. And what she's going to try and do is to tie some of these things together. And she's also going to take a look at the vision of one of Mississauga's very important individuals, very well known to everybody, I think pretty much in the 1970s, but very little known now. And that was Bruce McLaughlin who developed this particular area, square one, and uh, who built up the area around the Cawthorn Bloor uh, corners and down to Dundas Street from there. And this, so this area is really his vision. Kathleen is one of these prizes that we do have around because we tend to think of history as something that happened 100 years ago, and that's not quite true. Uh, Kathleen is actually our link to probably the 1960s and the 1970s uh, because she interviewed about 50 individuals in the 1970s who were considered to be at that point VIPs and without that work that she did in Mississauga News and for other forums, um, we wouldn't know much about our own modern history and this is what we want to have a look at tonight. But before I bring Kathleen down, uh, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going to be happening uh, within the next little while. Uh, the first is the annual general meeting, which is on the 21st of May. Uh, and it's at Clark Hall, one of the last remaining municipal halls that we have. If not the last remaining municipal hall we have outside of this one. And uh, I'm going to attempt to try and uh, wind us through the development of local government over the last 200 years. No mean feat, I'll tell you, in about half an hour, but I'm going to try and do it. Um, and uh, you're certainly welcome to come out. I promise you that it's a pretty fascinating story. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is May the 4th, and if you haven't yet done so, and I can say this, I can say this like a, like a real trooper in a circus bar, and there are very few tickets left. $25 a piece for our luncheon at Cherry Hill on Sunday, May 4th. And I would suggest uh, that you don't spend too much time thinking about it if you'd like to come. Um, talk to Cheryl tonight or talk to Gabe tonight about, about coming out to this because this is a very important event. Uh, after we do have the luncheon, uh, about, it's about 11.30, we're actually going to have uh, words from the counselor at that particular time and we'll have the meal. Afterwards, for a slightly additional charge, I'm going to take people around the, the four corners that are still left of Dixie. Grant, that's about it. Uh, but whatever's left of Dixie, I'm going to take you on a little tour. Of course, we're going to go to the graveyard behind Union Cemetery, which is really where this township actually, it was actually one of the points, the other, of course, being the Carson area, uh, where we first developed here. June the 15th, there is going to be uh, a bus tour that is going to do, take a look at the heritage of southern Mississauga. And again, what you could do is afterwards, you could speak to me about that, or you could speak to Gay about that, and we'd certainly be very, very uh, interested in telling you a little bit more about that. Back to Kathleen just for a second here. Kathleen has been a freelance writer for 35 years. And any of you have ever tried to uh, have a career in freelance writing know that that's almost an impossible task uh, to do so. So I think that she is to be commended very, very much uh, for doing that. Uh, she has done uh, a number of things. You, were, you said you were the first woman governor of the Mississauga Symphony at the invitation of Bruce McLaughlin as well, too. 
Kathy's been very, very <coughs> much involved in serving <coughs> community work uh, in, in Mississauga. And she's certainly going to tell you more about that as she gets into her talk tonight. So I'm not going to hold you up anymore. I would like to introduce Kathleen Hicks. I think you'll find this very fascinating. This is the McLaughlin Vision. Thank you. Presentation, uh, I should assure you, I did not borrow her suit. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure this evening to tell you about an ingenious man who had a tremendous vision for our city way before it was incorporated as the town of Mississauga on January 1st, 1967, and a city, the first to be established in the 20th century, on January 1st. 1974, Stuart Bruce McLaughlin. Bruce McLaughlin's dream of building a city came to him as early as 1951, when he was president of his own construction company, S.B. McLaughlin and Company Limited, which he had opened in 1949. If it were not for Bruce McLaughlin, our city center would probably still be at the four corners of Cooksville, where town council took care of municipal business for over 100 years. If it were not for Mr. McLaughlin, Cherry Hill House would have been demolished under the Wreckers Ball. Before I get into telling you about Bruce McLaughlin's involvement with the saving of Cherry Hill House, I would like you to know about his background and also that of Joseph Silverthorne. These two men were very similar in many ways. They both had a dream and started with an empty piece of wilderness and brought their dream to reality at great odds. They are both to be commended for their fortitude and perseverance. Bruce McLaughlin was born and raised in Toronto. He graduated high school at 16 and started to work. After a stint in the RCAF in World War II, he returned to his job as a sales and service rep for Bell Telephone working throughout southern Ontario. He then turned to building cottages in the Halliburton region and then built and operated a resort in Halliburton Highlands and through this experience decided that construction and development intrigued him. So he returned to this area and began building houses. His first single family homes in Toronto Township were built east of Dixie Mall called the Town and Country. In the early 50s, he studied property from Oshawa to the Niagara Belt and felt that along here Ontario Street, north of Burnethorpe, was prime real estate to build a new city and the best opportunity for a major assembly. So he concentrated on this area. He eventually purchased 4,000 acres north of Burnethorpe, west of here Ontario. He wanted here Ontario Street to be to Mississauga what Young Street is to Toronto. As his construction business boomed, he felt he needed more education, so he went back to school in 1954, got his BA with his major being economics. He got a law degree in 1964 and practiced law, all the while keeping a thumb on the pulse of progress. The groundbreaking ceremonies for his uh, own office building on this site took place in July of 1969. 1,500 people turned out. Back then, people thought he was out of his mind to put a building in the middle of a cow pasture. The UNIVAC building was next to follow on this site. He approached town council and offered to swap land where the municipal buildings were located, 100 Dundas Street West. The building at the top is the first uh, municipal building that was built in 1873, and the lower one was the one that the council was using at the time that he uh, approached them for the swapping plan. His proposal was finally accepted, uh, even though if there was much opposition. 
and the area was 10 acres uh, for the 100 Dundas Street West site. He built this five-story red brick building for town council. The town of Mississauga administration was moved in July of 1971. He became a mover and shaker for what is now our city core, a $5 billion project. He was referred to as the man who doesn't know the meaning of no. His theory for growth was, simply put, the primary concept is organized development, not sprawl. The area grew from there to our present day city hall here, which was opened July 18, 1987 by Prince Andrew and his wife Fergie, the Duke and Duchess of York. <coughs> Mr. McLaughlin purchased most of the land bordered between Cothra, Dundas, here Ontario, and Burnenthorpe. This picture I took uh, on, on Dundas at the bridge, and this is overlooking um, the Cothra, the Cothra Dundas area site. And uh, he started to construct residential homes to make a viable community for young families. These were some of the first homes in that area, and it became known as the Mississauga Valleys. Here is square one in the foreground, which opened October 3rd, 1973, on the 237-acre city center. Believe it or not, square one was called Greenfields Shopping Center during the negotiations that took place to get it approved. When it was built, square one was the largest enclosed shopping mall in Canada, with 1.5 million square feet of shopping space and a parking lot for 6,300 cars. This picture looks out over the Mississauga Valleys to the north, which was Mr. McLaughlin's constructive genius at work. 720 acres with 9,000 housing units, townhouses, and apartment buildings constructed by 15 builders. This is the area in 1983. These are the Canop buildings on the, on the right. And the Ship Mississauga Executive Center Complex buildings on the uh, left. Both these men contributed much to the growth of our city as well. Gordon Ship and his son Harold, who established G.S. Ship and Son, now known as the Ship Corporation, in 1947 in the Kingsway, Etobicoke area, came here in 1951 and purchased 23 acres on the south side of the QEW and began constructing the first of 850 Applewood Acre homes. Applewood Heights, located on the Colonel Thomas Kennedy property, north of Dundas, and the more prestigious Applewood Hills homes followed, then skyscraper business centers, such as these. Upon his arrival here from Bulgaria in 1951, A.B. Canham got his start with the ships as a laborer for a dollar and ten cents an hour. He arrived in his chosen country with five dollars in his pocket. Within a year, he constructed his first house and by 1958, his first apartment building. And as you travel around Mississauga, and see his trademark white impressive buildings, you can say the rest is history. On a portion of this Mississauga Valley's land sat the former home of Jane and Joseph Silverthorne. This is taken again from the Dundas and that is looking east over the Cherry Hill property. The Cherry Hill house is hidden amongst all those trees. The Peel County Road Commission. The Peel County Road Commission had purchased a portion of the property for the bridge at the Cawthorn Dundas uh, corner here. The Cherry Hill site was part and parcel of that transaction, and again, Cherry Hill is hidden behind the grove of trees.
These are the most uh, popular pictures of Jane and Joseph Silverthorn, Thorn, if not the only one of Jane, we do have another one of Joseph. Unfortunately, uh, we have nothing of them younger for this portion of the talk. Joseph Silverthorn came from a tremendously industrious family that started with a courageous adventurer, Oliver, who was the first Silverthorn to make his way from Glastonbury, England to America in the early 1700s with his wife Mary and their four sons. One of the sons was Thomas, Joseph's grandfather, who fought in the American Revolution 1775 to 1783 and suffered greatly at the hands of the enemy. After the war, over 50,000 Britishers faithful to King George III made an exodus northward to Canada where they found refuge from their oppressors. Thomas, his wife Johanna, son John, his wife Esther, and their son, new son Joseph made a 300 mile trek from New Jersey to Niagara in 1786. Three of their daughters, Nancy, Winifred, and Mary, had arrived in 1783. Nancy was married to William Lundy, for whom Lundy's, name was, Lundy's Lane was named, as he was the first settler in the area. The new settlers were under the charge of a commander-in-chief, Sir Guy Carlton. They became known as United Empire Loyalists, so named by him for their loyalty to their king and country. Colonel John Gray Simcoe was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada in 1791, and he saw to the giving of land grants to all who settled in Upper Canada, now the province of Ontario. Thomas died in the hungry year of 1788 and didn't get to enjoy the luxury of owning land, but his son John and wife Johanna saw to it that they received his due posthumously. <laughs> Can people see you all right, or do they? Do you want me to lower it? Oh, all right? Okay. Sorry. Saw to it that they received his due posthumously and had his name put on the United Empire Loyalist list. They eventually received over 1,500 acres in Niagara between the three of them. When Joseph was turning the required age of 21 in 1806, he received his grant, which happened to be Lot 11, North Dundas Street, in Toronto Township. He married James Chisholm on March 17, 1807, when she was only 15. Her 16th birthday was on April 11th, and on April 18th, they left Niagara with Joseph's father, John, a black serpent dyna green, two cows and their belongings. Many of you have already heard the story of their boat trip across Lake Ontario, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I will relate it for you. Captain Joseph Hen Kendrick and his brother Hiram and Sailor Pete transported them across Lake Ontario on their ship, the Hunter. It was a cold, blustery day and the terribly strong wind that whipped, it whipped the Hunter off course Instead of heading up the mouth of the Etobicoke Creek, which was their destination, they ended up in the Toronto Bay outside of York, now Toronto. They spent the night in the tavern of the Dr. Stoyles, and the next day were taken in a smaller boat by Sailor P. A gale caused them to spend another night at the mouth of the Humber, and finally, the next day, they made the rest of the journey up the Etobicoke Creek without mishap. John went east to visit settlers he knew, while Joseph and Jane and Dinah trekked westward in ankle-deep mud to their property, Lot 11. They were the first guests to stay in Philip Cody's newly established inn on Lot 10, South Dundas Street. They resided there all summer while Joseph cleared his land and built his 18 by 20 cabin for his new wife. This Philip Cody was the first Toronto Township resident and is the grandfather of William Frederick Cody, more famously known as Buffalo Bill. The infamous Pony Express rider and Wild West show entrepreneur from America. Buffalo Bill's father Isaac was born in Toronto Township on September 15, 1811 
the sixth child in a family of nine. As a young man, he left for America where his son was born in Scott County, Iowa, February 26, 1846. Buffalo Bill founded Cody, Wyoming in 1902 and opened an inn there and named it after his wife, Irma. John visited his son Joseph so much that he was counted as a resident in the survey of 1807 done by Samuel Wilmot. John purchased Lot 6 in 1808 and Lot 4 in 1809, but he didn't purchase land in Etobicoke and move here until 1810 when he bought 400 acres on the east bank of the Etobicoke Creek from grantee James Crawford. Circled at the top there. He and his sons Thomas, Aaron, and George would sign many settlement duty papers and hold mortgages for the settlers along Dundas Street. In fact, it can be said that John, Aaron, and George, and Alan Robinet, Joseph's neighbor to the west, were the first bankers and real estate salesmen in Toronto Township. Joseph served in the War of 1812 in the York Militia along with his brothers Aaron and Thomas. Joseph and Jane's family grew from Johanna, born their first year of marriage to Catherine in 1810, Esther 1812, and their first son George in 1814. They would have 12 children, 9 girls and 3 boys. Only one died as a child, Callista born 1826 and died September 12, 1827. Joseph built a stone house in 1815, and that's the uh, rear section there, for his rapidly growing family, and added on their Cherry Hill Mansion on the front in 1822. The veranda was constructed around 1850. Jane and Joseph saw tremendous growth in their community over the years, such as the building of the Log Union Church and the arrival of new settlers, who would make names for themselves as time passed. Daniel Harris owned Lot 15 South Dundas Street and completed his settlement duties in 1809. His property bordered on a creek now known as the Cooksville Creek, and he put up a saw and potash mill. The area became known as Harrisville for a while. Jacob Cook moved here in 1816 with his parents to Lot 33, North Dundas Street. He purchased Lot 16, south of Dundas, in 1819. He got the first contract to deliver mail in 1920 and traveled a 45-mile trek from York to Ancaster. He later ran a hotel and a stagecoach line, and the area was renamed for this industrious resident. John Schiller owned Lot 17, west of Centre Road, now here Ontario Street. Around 1820, he found wild grapes growing on the banks of the Credit River, took cuttings and cultivated them until he had a magnificent vineyard. He is noted as the founder of the grape and wine industries in Canada. John Belcher, a blacksmith from Lot 7, would purchase part of Lot 16 and move his blacksmith shop there in 1843, which caused the 1852 Cooksville Fire that demolished the prosperous Toronto Township core. And the arrival of many doctors, all of whom Joseph counted as friends. Dr. Joseph Adamson, who with his brother General Peter Adamson emigrated here from Dundee, Scotland. Dr. Adamson was to be the physician for the Mississauga Indians for which he would receive 100 pounds annually. He and his brother, are the founders of St. Peter's Church in Arendelle, along with Reverend James McGrath. Dr. Crew came to the Cooksville area at the request of his good friend Jacob Cook in 1836. He brought Lot 13 southwest of Cherry Hill and set up an office in surgery. He called his place Stafford House. When Dr. Crew passed away, Jacob Cook, who had lost his wife, married Dr. Crew's widow, Sarah. When Dr. Adamson died in July of 1852, his colleague, Dr. Beaumont Dixie, took over his practice. He lived in Arendelle, but the area between Cooksville and Somerville, where John Silverthorne lived, would be named for this popular physician in 1864. Another prominent historical event Joseph Silverthorne was involved in was the William Lyon Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837. 
The Silverthorn men and their neighbors joined William Chisholm, Jane's cousin who founded Oakville, his militia, and with troops led by Sheriff Jarvis and Lieutenant Governor Francis Bondhead, stormed Montgomery's Inn on Young Street and sent Mackenzie fleeing from the country. There is quite often a confusion made about the two George Silverthorns involved in this historical happening. Joseph's brother, George, owned a farm at the mouth of the Humber River in Toronto, and he was a Mackenzie sympathizer, much to the dismay of his father, John, and brother, Joseph. Joseph's 20-year-old son, George, however, on, uh, on the other hand, was a true blue Tory, like his father, and fought alongside him against Mackenzie. Joseph's brother, George, was so ostracized by his friends and neighbors for his involvement with the Mackenzie Rebellion that he had to move his family away. They ended up in Wisconsin in 1842. Jane and Joseph lived to celebrate 72 years of married life. For their 70th anniversary, March 17, 1877, they had a tremendous gathering of their family and friends at Cherry Hill. It was their last party held at the popular mansion, for Joseph passed away on June 11, 1879, and Jane followed a few months later on November 4th. This left their daughters, Helen, Janet, and Augusta, in the house to carry on alone. This is Janet on your left, and this is another daughter, Jane, on the right. These three ladies were well loved by all who knew them. They had grown up with sociable natures. Augusta played the organ, and the other girls sang in the choir in the stone chapel that had been built in 1837 and is still standing today. And I believe that big monument is the Silverthorn Burial. Is that right, Bill? I'm not sure that there may be more. I think it's the largest table. one in the cemetery. And it, it looks it seems like to be a large one. Oh, on the uh, behind St. John's Church, yes, but that's the original. And uh, all the girls loved to ride horses and garden. There were always relatives and friends staying at the house. In Joseph's later years, latter years, he had rented out parts of his property. The girls eventually began to sell off parcels of the land uh, to keep themselves. Janet died. August 12, 1901, at age 84. Helen passed away on October 16, 1905, age 76, leaving Jane and Joseph's baby Augusta, now 70, on her own. When she died, December 16, 1908, she left Cherry Hill House to her favorite nephew, Willie Walsh. He was the son of Jane and Joseph's favorite granddaughter, Emma the daughter of Elizabeth and Pierre Romaine, who had moved to Montreal after the Cooksville fire when their home and store was burned to the ground. Willie Walsh grew up in Montreal where he got the acting bug at age 17. He was discovered by a popular producer of the period, David Velasco. He made his debut at Government House. He received a scholarship to the American Acting Academy for Youth. He joined Henry Irving's acting troupe and changed his name to William Stanislaus Romain, using his mother's maiden name. In the late 1890s, he would become a famous Shakespearean actor, sharing the stage with the popular actresses of the day, Sarah Bernhardt, Alan Terry, and one of his close friends, Mary Pickford, who also happened to be a Canadian. When he first inherited Cherry Hill House, he was traveling quite a lot to Europe and America with Sir, Sir Henry Irving's troupe. Irving was the first actor to be knighted, which was done by Queen Victoria in 1895. Mr. Romaine rented out half the house so he could, uh, so it would be occupied during his absences. From his correspondence with his close friend Jenny Goldthorpe, the aunt of Mildred Belgium, who became an opera singer, it was apparent that he loved his home, Cherry Hill. He gave many lavish parties when he was home and used to dress up in his elaborate costumes and quote Shakespeare for his guests. Some of the occupants over the years were the Hutchinsons. Mr. Hutchinson was the CPR station master. 
Mr. and Mrs. Banks had a tea room in the early 1920s. Mildred's two brothers, Albert and Grafton, rented a portion of the front room for the, from the uh, Grahams for an ice cream party for a time. All the furnishings, many made by Joseph's hand, were still in the house in 1933 when Dora Royce was doing research for Perkins Bull, who was writing the history of Peel County at the time. She made out a complete list of the contents. This dresser and mirror, oh, excuse me. Yes, please. This dresser and mirror is uh, now owned by Betty Bull, who used to have uh, Lila Blaine's antique uh, shop on here, Ontario, at the corner of Eglinton. And this um, cupboard here, um, Bill had up at uh, Peel Heritage Complex. And uh, we also had a picture of it open with all of the blankets, heavy blankets and everything in it. And um, these two pictures are of the uh, four poster beds that Joseph made. And uh, one of them, uh, Betty Bow owned them both. And uh, she now lives up on Derry Road, and I was up there and got these pictures. But since she has sold one to Don Silverthorne, the Etobicoke Silverthorne, I don't know which one it was that they purchased. The other two pictures are from the artifacts at Bradley House. Tenants came and went, and as time passed, many of the antiques were stolen or sold. When Mr. Romaine would return, he was terribly disturbed by the thefts taking place. After his World War I experience, when he was gravely wounded, he had to give up traveling and stage acting. He taught acting for a while, and his health declined until he was put in the House of Providence in Hamilton, where he died in May of 1951. The house and property were left to his lawyer, Thomas Joseph Day, but by this time one of Romaine's dear friends, Nellie Lindsay, and her two children, John and Daisy Ann, were ensconced in the house. His stipulation to his old friend was that she and her children could live there for the remainder of their lives. Nellie died in 1958 and John on September 18, 1960. In 1972, I was working with the Mississauga News as an editorial columnist. During my interview with Mildred Belgian, who had been my teacher and taught in Toronto Township for over 30 years, uh, on May 7, 1972, for my VIP column, she told me a lot of wonderful stories about Cherry Hill and the Silver Thorns, and I was immediately fascinated. I was familiar with the property, as I lived right across, around the corner once on Granville Drive, and now resided on the north section of Joseph's property, as it happened. I had always admired the attractive tree lot Cherry Hill sat on, but to me, as to others, it was just an old house with a witch in it. After learning the true story and its historical value, I, like Mildred, became worried that a piece of art history would be destroyed. Mildred informed me that the Mississauga Historical Society, of which she was a member, had wanted to save the house, as did the Peel Historical Society, but neither organizations had money to do so. I knew I had to do something, so I went to Cherry Hill the next day to see if I could talk to Miss Lindsay. I got to the house and knocked on the, on the open door, all the while glancing inside at, at the clutter. An eerie feeling crept up my spine, and I was about to leave when a young couple came up behind me. I told them who I was and what I was doing there. I didn't tell them I worked for a newspaper. They in turn introduced themselves as the marshals who lived on Cothra. Doug had been uh, doing errands for Miss Lindsay and helping her with the place. Doug told me that Miss Lindsay had disappeared and he was concerned about her. He offered to show me through the house and we moved, as we moved from room to room, he and his sister kept making remarks about things being missing or doors being opened or closed since their last visit. Obviously, someone had been in the house stealing the furniture, which at the time I didn't realize were valuable antiques. It infuriated me. I couldn't get home soon enough. I knew I had to tell someone about Miss Lindsay's disappearance and the theft that was taking place at Cherry Hill. And what better person than my editor, editor at the Mississauga News, Ron Lane? I was not aware that the Peel County Roads Commission owned the property that Cherry Hill sat on, 
nor that Mr. McLaughlin was responsible for the Mississauga Valley's area that was growing up around my own home. But Ron Lennick did, and he notified Mr. McLaughlin. He immediately had the doors and windows boarded up and placed a 24-hour guard through Graham Protection Services on the oldest homestead in Peel County. A write-up on the house appeared in the uh, next issue of the Mississauga News, and the saving of the house that Joseph built was underway. I interviewed Mr. McLaughlin for VIP and on May 17th. It was an enlightening hour and one of the reasons I am so knowledgeable on him. He was extremely interested in Cherry Hill and we discussed the plight of the house as we came to the end of our time together. The Rhodes Commission recommended that the house be turned over to Mr. McLaughlin for possible restoration. Upon hearing this news, I called his house, his office, excuse me, <laughs> uh, I was looking at it for that, to offer my services to raise money for this worthwhile project. His information officer, Ron Duquette, asked me to write a brief on the house that Mr. McLaughlin could present to his board to show that there was significant cause to say what looked like the dilapidated relic. I called Mildred and got some articles from her for my research. I had to give as much detail as I could so Mr. McLaughlin and his board would be able to visualize the house as it used to be and the family who had resided there and the history involved in the old place. I told of the large sturdy house with ceiling oak rafters and oak beams that supported floors of white pine of the cellar foundation of field stone that had a big summer kitchen and an enormous fire, fireplace where three-foot logs could be burned. The history of the Silverthorns unfolded, giving an interesting and intriguing past. The brief and Mr. McLaughlin's enthusiasm worked. It was decided that Cherry Hill House was a viable piece of Canadiana, and plans were put in motion for the refurbishing to commence. Not long after this, the JCs asked me to write an article for a booklet that they were putting out on Mississauga. Mississauga as a city. One on our late mayor, Robert Speck. As it also happens, I was the last person to interview him before he passed away on April 5, 1972. And the other article on Cherry Hill House. I agreed. I used my brief to put the article together on Cherry Hill. From the information Mildred had given me, however, I was later to discover that many of the facts contained therein were wrong, and to this day, that article still haunts me. Because I keep seeing these facts appear in various other words. One being that Joseph received a grant of 1,000 acres instead of 200, another that they had 14 children instead of 12, and the wrong comparisons from the two Georges, about the two Georges that I told you about. A writer is only as good as his or her research material. The project was put into the capable hands of Ron Duquette. His feelings about the old house were pointed. Cherry Hill is worth saving, he stated in an article written by news reporter Jim Robinson. It's a landmark. No, a symbol of the pioneering that went on here. Sketches of the pr proposed restoration were prepared by the firm R.E. Winter and Associates, consulting engineers for the McLaughlin Group, and that's what they perceived it to look like, which isn't what we see today, but however, <laughs> I guess most plans are like that. Kathy, but before we go on, uh, maybe people may not be aware of just how the class did go in, but the orientation is quite different, is it not? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. It's they don't have the plaza uh, like that. It's just one strip out to the side of Cherry Hill to the, to the south of Cherry Hill. And the house sits on about that much property if the parking lot is in the back of the house as well. So it's very limited for uh, its own area. And it's certainly not as focal as this would have made it. No. No. On May 2, 1973, Ron held a presentation at the Mississauga Central Library on Dundas Street in Cooksville to disclose the blueprints and give a discourse on Cherry Hill. Mildred and I attended in earnest. Ron disclosed that the initial plan was to have this house moved 400 yards north onto McLaughlin property, 
Once it was relocated, work would begin to restore it to its original splendor and open it as a period restaurant and museum. As Dr. Gary Crawford informed you last week, before the move took place, two archaeological digs were to be done by the Ontario Archaeological Society that works out of the University of Toronto. That is uh, Dr. Howard Savage, whoops, <laughs> on the uh, left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> realized the other day as I was preparing this presentation that it was not only 190 years ago that Jane and Joseph got married, 175 years since the Cherry Hill House was moved, which we are celebrating this year, but 25 years ago since I helped save the house in May of 1972. I also realized that it probably brought about the archaeological digs as well. I had interviewed Elsa Kramer, an archaeologist data for my VIP call. Fascinated by her occupation, I told her about Cherry Hill. Well, she immediately tried to arrange to do a date and was refused. I called Lou Parsons, who at the time was the Peel Regional Chairman. Next thing I knew, there was a date arranged, so I guess I helped out in that respect too. Anyway, Dr. Howard Savage, president of the OAS, and his staff of 20 did the first date in October of 1972. Dr. Savage prepared a brief on their findings in April of 73 called Life at Cherry Hill. They had uncovered 2,271 artifacts from the period 1880 to early 1900s when the three Silverthorn girls were on their own and the many ranchers resided there. The second dig in June of 73 was written up by Dr. Gary Crawford, who was our speaker last week. I think we should point out, Kathy, to those of those people who were here last week, those are the ink wells yes. after they were restored. Yes, he showed the, the he picture showed them before, the brochure, yeah. and that's after they're cleaned out. But these shoes are from Cherry Hill House, but they were up at the Peel um, Heritage Complex. He gave a brief description on the Silverthorns in the house and then detailed the date. This date was more productive than the first. It gave a far more reaching glimpse into pioneer life. These pictures are some of the artifacts uncovered, which are on display at the Bradley Museum for viewing. The Canadian Room on the third floor of the library also displays Cherry Hill artifacts. I believe they have a, a, some of them there now. Um, Cherry Hill House was moved in late June of 1973 to the corner of Silver Creek Boulevard and Lolita Gardens. A special road was built to move the house on at a cost of $4,000. Stanwall House Movers were contracted to do the job. They estimated the house to weigh some 90 tons, 55 of that being in chimneys and fireplaces. This is um, the layout. The bottom um, pink circle is where the house was located, and the 400 yards north uh, is the top pink circle. And that's Mississauga Valley's in the, in the back, and those are the two tower apartments that uh, Mr. McLaughlin um, owned. And when the digs were done, Ron Duquette put on a display of the artifacts in those uh, two, or one of those two that, buildings. That rope there, I mean, this is obviously that white rose to that. Yes. What is that? Is that that's what's now it's, the? It's part of the um, the overpassway uh, on the ramp road. The road. Yeah. It's been totally reconfigured. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's not there. That now. was the no. That was the uh, old part of uh, Dundas. When, when Dr. Carver last week said the the actual bypass is now through where the house used to be. Now that's how it's been reconfigured. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where are we? Uh, where's Cox now? Right here it's on, on the, uh, the south side, east side. Yeah. The east yeah. side. Just where you can see a road ending there? Or, uh, right, right to the very right of the street. Now that the bridge is there. Right. So that's what Foster is, and where we now turn and to do the bottom class is where the lower yellow uh, the bridge is here with the, uh, with the turn so to Dundas. And that's Mississauga Valley's in the top area. 
The main wooden section of the house was in good condition and sturdy. The solid oak beams and rafters structurally sound, but they were concerned about the stone section and thought it would crumble if they tried to move it intact. So the basement and back section were broken down and numbered so that they could be reconstructed precisely as Joseph had laid his hand to them in the early 1800s. As these pictures reveal, it was not an easy task. The public turned out in droves to watch and had to be told to avoid the area for fear of accidents occurring. The newspapers were on hand to record the event. The house was finally at its new resting place. The basement was dug and the section set out in proper order. The back section was reconstructed and the front part uh, put in place and the refurbishing could begin. The exterior was worked on diligently and uh, to bring it to its previous 1850 state of repair. A new veranda had to be constructed. As little as you saw from the other pictures revealed, there was very little of it left. If you look closely, you'll see a lady perched on the railing. That's me. <laughs> One of the perks of working for a newspaper, you can always get a photographer to go wherever you want. <laughs> The interior was to be restored to exactly the way the Silverthorns had designed it and lived in it for over a hundred years. The house was opened in 1979 as a restaurant and pub. These pictures show you that the old colonial setting has been retained. This is the restaurant foyer. That was the restaurant foyer. Pause. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is one of the uh, first floor uh, restaurant dining room. Okay, and just for orientation, would that have been in the front parlor? <coughs> I'm not exactly sure of the layout, um, to tell you the truth. Because the other room, on, that looks like the larger of the two rooms. The it is. Room is smaller, the small room behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the parlor. That is the, um, it is now the north, north part of the house, on the north side. Uh, and this is the Duke of uh, Marlborough pub, and that is a big, uh, that is the summer kitchen that's in the basement, and that is the big uh, fireplace that I mentioned that held three foot logs. This restaurant has been operated for the past 10 years uh, by Tom Scarella and Sandro Julita. And I guess they're celebrating 10 years this year, so it's quite a year for everyone. They're celebrating 10 years, and the restaurant is celebrating from 1979 to 1997. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In September of 1974, I was commissioned by Mr. McLaughlin to write a book about the Silver Thorns of Cherry Hill. I was thrilled and excited about the project and took it on with much enthusiasm. I spent two years delving into the family's intriguing history, and then the project was shut. The house was sold to Triumph, and I was left with a manuscript that wasn't going to be published after all. Every once in a while, I would pull it out, present it to a publisher, try to get a grant, but I never got anywhere with it. Then in 1988, the utopical branch of the family, knowing I was an authority on the Silver Thorns, asked me to write a book for them. I interviewed their elderly family members, researched tirelessly, read the three enormous volumes put out by the Silverthorne Association that has thousands of members, all descendants of Oliver, that Heather Broadbent had on display at her presentation. I spent three years or so putting manuscript together and then it went through three drafts before it went to the editor. It was a slow process, but finally came to fruition last November when it was published by Coach House Press. There's a copy of it here on this table that I set up for your uh, viewing uh, later on. Now, after all this time, I have the opportunity of seeing my Cherry Hill manuscript published as well. Our chief librarian, Don Mills, has read my manuscript recently and told me that the library wants to see it published, and I'd like to ask him to please stand up at this time, Don Mills. <laughs> my I presented a copy of my book, The Silver Thorns, Ten Generations in America, to the Canadian Room on January 8th, officially opening the library's heritage year. One plan, our plan is for my book on Cherry Hill 
to be published and presented in December, winding up Heritage Year. I think back finally on Mr. McLaughlin. If it were not for him, I never would have researched the silver thorns. I never would have put a manuscript together for them, or for together on them. Also, in September of 1974, he had Ron call me and asked me to become a governor on the board of the Mississauga Symphony, which Mr. McLaughlin founded. I was thrilled. I always seem to be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> My first meeting was January 22, 1975, and I remember after he introduced me to the illustrious group, All Men, he said I was their rose amongst the thorns. I've never forgotten that. So I was the first lady governor on the Mississauga Symphony. I've never, uh, the Mississauga Symphonic Association is celebrating 25 years this year, and my being the first lady governor is going to be highlighted, which I'm quite happy about. There's also a picture of that on this, uh, of uh, my first meeting with uh, Mr. McLaughlin, and then it was in, on the front page of Mississauga News. Um, like the man I mentioned in Joseph's life, Daniel Harris, Jacob Cook, the Adamsons, and Reverend James McGrath and others, who built up our small communities. They were the Bruce McLaughlin of their day. They left behind parts of themselves. 190 years after they came here and set up Toronto Township, we still remember them, for they left us an illustrious heritage, as did Gordon and Harold Ship and Amy Canada. They formed our communities the same as Bruce McLaughlin formed our city center. He was determined to build a city of tomorrow for people of today, and he succeeded. From what we, now, we know of our pioneers, they too felt the same way and had the same dream, and we are their benefactors. All the historical elements that we enjoy around our city, they started. It is our legacy. The city center is Bruce McLaughlin, legacy to us, the fulfillment of his dream. I end my Cherry Hill manuscript with this. Landmarks of the past are symbols left by the pioneers that allow us never to forget our vital heritage. It is up to all of us to preserve the past and carry it forward for all who come after us. That is what the Mississauga Heritage Foundation is doing by holding this series on the Cherry Hill House. It has been my joy and privilege to be part of it, and I thank you. Bill Barker and Gay Pepin for including me in this program. And I thank you all for attending tonight. Do we have any questions? Kathy, I'm so confused about the money for the restoration for the building. Mr. Um, McLaughlin paid for it entirely. For the whole thing, all the restoration, like that, and the loop, and the clean the road, everything. Uh, but did he then own the building once he died? Yes, it was put on his property, and he owned it, and he restored it, and he had every intention, I guess, of, but something happened that he decided to let the project go. Maybe it got too expensive, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Triumph bought it, but I don't know who the interim between Tom and so if he hadn't stepped in and, and put the money forward, the house would have just been demolished. Why would we have more about it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Where is Mr. McLaughlin now? He lives in a home, in a home that he bought in uh, Mississauga Valley, or Mississauga Road, excuse me. <laughs> and he's still working his development company in Toronto. Regarding the Mississauga Symphony, you're suggesting Bruce McLaughlin started it. With with the other people on the board. I, I would think that One of the more more credit should be given to Nancy Reed and exactly. my wife Jenna Clarkson, who <laughs> worked day and night to establish exactly. the Mississauga Symphony. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were other family members as well, a lot of art workers to put it together. He was president of the board when I was there. Anybody else? Kathleen, just because you mentioned that the house what represents the oldest 
The oldest Where's, house in Peel County. What uh, other buildings uh, from that vintage are still uh, in existence? I'm not sure the age of, of Ben Aries or uh, Thread, Bradley House and Clarkson. I'm not sure the age, yet, but I don't think any of them were built before Cherry Hill in 1822. No, the Bradley was later in 1830s. Ben Aries is the 1850s. Mm -hmm. I think your closest one is Timothy Street House, which is the Well, we moved the Bradley House from Port to, to its present location. Mm -hmm. It was the second home of Lewis Bradley Hill. But its original location was oh, on yes. the lake. That's right. But it dates from the movie the 1830s. It's probably the track holes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 2,000 artifacts that uncovered in the data seems incredible. Is there any mm -hmm. rationale for why they were so sloppy? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no garbage pickup in the data, wasn't it? Last week, it was the best. Well, we, uh, County Council, yeah. uh, offered us a grant for the money. I think Bill will confirm this. To do some of the dates. For the dates, yes. And the answer we got back at County Council was, yes. Council yes. Council yes. Council yes. Council yes. Council yes. was yes. that, uh, yes. Council yes. Council yes. that uh, Many of the artifacts uh, really they didn't find anything of uh, any great substance, and uh, 2,000, I think there's maybe a half a dozen that really amounted to anything. Which well, I think, I think that was the story. Yeah. Once, uh, once, the the yeah. once, once they were studied, they, and, and a lot of the stuff was, was put together, it really tells us. Well, I didn't story. report that back to Common Council because, as far as we're concerned, <laughs> There were bags and bags and boxes of uh, artifacts, and, and they, they weren't of any great value. Right? Well, as Gary Crawford told us last week, they, they uh, excavated Merrick's dump, and they just had a tremendous amount of bottles yeah. and such like that. And I imagine a lot of them are individual little pieces, and some of the dishes were broken, things like mm -hmm. that, vases and things, so they might have uh, called them like five or six pieces and then put them together as one. For a lot so, of bottles, that was from, purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was from Dr. Savage's uh, right up that he said that they had uncovered that many articles. Apparently, well, if, yeah. if you look at your, if you go back to the Nares, uh, when they were excavating the uh, privy, <laughs> they found all of these articles. Because, of course, uh, it was an area that once it was no longer going to be used for its original purpose, exactly. uh, became a garbage site. People didn't right. have garbage pickup, so no, they had any holes, holes or area or anything. Bottoms, anything mm -hmm. else was tossed into, into a hole. Into into a hole. Into a hole. Into exactly. exactly. And I can't remember now, but I know that uh, I think it was more than 2,000 artifacts that they found there. Really? They, they, they did. Mm -hmm. I did know the figure at one point, but there's, uh, that's what you stored right now with the uh, mm -hmm. you know, Heritage Foundation. The Bradley collection, that we are still trying to get all catalog. As far, as far as the silver thorn goes, are there any uh, uh, living other than Newman men who married Margaret Powell? Yes, um, the 10th generation, they just had some new grandchildren. Uh, there's uh, Don and uh, Gideon and his sister Margaret, who used to write the book. Uh, the elderly Gideon passed away, and his brother Ralph White, who yeah. 88, have since mm -hmm. passed away as well as mm -hmm. the White now. But the, they waited, the book was on hold for um, quite a little while so that these grandchildren could be born and put in the book. <laughs> so I didn't take 10 years to write it, it was nine years to write it. It just, they dragged their feet a lot before we got it published. But uh, it was so nice to hold my hand and hardcover it that. You, know. you mentioned your manuscript on the Yes. Does that cover going back? Exactly. Mm -hmm. forward? So mm -hmm. basically, we've been given kind of synopsis. Exactly. Great. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. expecting that only in November. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That's what it's all the Now, is this going to be available? I know that the Silver Throne book is not available to the public. That's fine. This will be available for purchase for the public. That's our goal with our intention. The Silver Thorn book is just a private commission by the It was, yes, yeah, just a limited edition, 150 copies for family members. Yeah.
two copies were donated to the Canadian Army, so you can read it there. That's the way I used to do all my research in the 70s, was at the Canadian Room when it was at the Dundas location. And you had to sit there all day and write everything out. You couldn't read everything, and it was kind of frustrating. But um, at least we have this lovely facility now, which is marvelous. Um, just seeing the house being moved, it seems so sad to see the ch cherry trees and I guess the demise. And your book tells a wonderful story about where they came from and, exactly. and how widely they were spread. Mm -hmm. Oliver took cuttings from his Glastonbury home, brought them to New Jersey in the United States. Uh, when they came up after the American Revolution, um, Thomas and John, his son John, took cuttings from their cherry trees and transported them to Niagara. When Joseph moved here, the same thing happened. And when George went down to Wisconsin, he also took cuttings from the family's trees. And there's quite a lot of cherry trees in Wisconsin, thanks to George. But they just kept uh, building and building with these cherry trees. But with Joseph, he planted them uh, up the side of the driveway and then a good uh, mile into the back of his house. So that's how the house got its name. But when I went there in 70, there were no cherry trees. I don't think there had been any fruit trees or anything around because everything was overgrown from neglect and, and they just gradually died off. But uh, it's just such a shame. The girls also planted a lilac lane, which uh, was quite uh, pretty too, I imagine, from what I've heard. They were all great gardeners. You mentioned, uh, or one of the speakers mentioned something about a variety of apple cobs. So they did have apple trees as well. I said it was kind of sour apples, I guess. They did have apple trees. Jane used to really love her apple trees. I read uh, one of the letters from her granddaughter, Emma, and she said Grandma couldn't live without her apple trees. So. And they, they had some uh, berry tree, other berry, uh, black cherry, I believe, that the birds really liked. And so they had to put a net over this tree to keep the birds away because they ate all their black cherry. As it stands now, uh, and of course that's not seen in some of the photographs we saw tonight, but uh, they planted trees on the front lawn from leaves and crab apple. I haven't heard that, but I know they had a big black walnut tree that also came from New Jersey up to Niagara. It's still there because I went down and got some walnuts off the ground after the house was moved. Yeah, um, I think it's the walnut trees are still there. Okay, but in the new site for the cherry grove, they yeah. planted uh, mm -hmm. trees in front of the Yes, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. well, we're hoping, and Andrew's previous weather today is encouraging, that they'll be able to blossom mm -hmm. on the May 4th. That, that, that would be pricey, <laughs> even though I'm old this spring is thin. I must mention as well that uh, I'm also involved in another um, uh, historical home, the Riverwood um, estate, which was uh, built by the Parkers and um, purchased by the chapels. Some of you, I'm sure, remember Hill Chapel. It was the MP South. And uh, I recently did a documentary with Cable 10, and it was on last night, and it's on again tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, as well as 12:30 uh, noon on Saturday, and it gives uh, some more uh, history on that house. And the uh, city of Mississauga is going to have that as its public garden, so I'm very excited about that project as well. And I'm doing that with the Mississauga Garden Council. I'm director on the Garden Council. When was that? Up? 19, the Chapel House? Yeah. <coughs> 1919. Mm -hmm. as, yes, as some of you will probably know, the um, Indians owned a mile on each side of the Credit River. And then they gave up uh, the property, I believe, above Dundas. And then mills up in Streetsville and whatnot started to be built. And then, uh, I'm not sure the gentleman's first name, I think it was Thomas Racy. Bought the property, was it? And uh, he couldn't keep up his mortgage payments, so the government took it back and then they gave up grants. And so that property was originally 200 acres, and 100 acres was given to uh, William McGrath, if I remember correctly, and Peter McDougall. And uh, then uh, uh, Alan Case bought it in 1912, and the Parkers purchased it in 1913, and then they 
they built this magnificent house. When did Hill Shire buy? 88. Cancer. When did he buy? Why did he buy? When did he buy? Pardon? When did he buy the house? 54. But they didn't bring any money until the next year. But it's a beautiful house. It's a hysterical home as well now. Is there any truth to the argument going that I hear going on that possibly Mrs. Sarva will not develop Hill's property because there is a, the feeling among the other side of the argument that it should be retained in its natural wild state? Well, they intend to leave a great amount of it in its natural state. A lot of people are not aware of that. They think they're going to go in there and bulldoze and put in all these magnificent gardens. They're not. And they're going to leave the deer and the, the animals to live in their natural habitat. And I think people are, uh, we have a lot of opposition about it because of that. They expect to leave that property just sitting there vacant for the deer's, deer to live on. And uh, they have no intentions of going in there and, and destroying what is uh, nature has made. It's, it's a beautiful location, I'm sure. They just are a little bit wrapped up at the art center, living art center, and the Iceland right now. But as soon as uh, we'll be getting the go ahead very shortly to start fundraising, and we'll just be starting with uh, a couple of small, two or three small gardens, as the, the documentary will explain, and uh, leave everything mostly in its natural state, just cleaning up, putting in the parking lots where they have to be put in. But um, on the most part, it will be kept in its natural state. There will be uh, walkways put through so that people can walk around and enjoy the trees and the flowers and whatnot. Bill used to write up the river valley to our property and down his horse and over the years. It's beautiful in there. Just walking along David Cullen Trail is a tree and along the edge of the Red River. It's marvelous. Question. Do you know anything about Glen Erin Inn? Glen Erin Inn? Yes. Uh, the same people who designed the chapel house designed the Glen Erin Inn. Uh, but I don't know too much about it. It's a, it's a lovely um, <coughs> facility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, the, all the historical homes in Mississauga are lovely. I just wish that um, we had a, like a Black Creek Village or something where they were all together and we could go and enjoy them all in one location. It's a shame that they're spread all over the city, but I'm glad that they've been saved and that we have that option to do that. I think it's more a case of letting people know where they are. Exactly. Uh, many of them are not on major roads, so mm -hmm. more people are often not aware that they're there. That's like, right. Like it's difficult to find. Example. Mm -hmm. That being talked about the college way, many people come down to the side road and literally pass it, but mm -hmm. on the rear side of it and don't realize it's there. That's um, right. And likewise with Meadowville Village, which mm -hmm. has some excellent examples of architectural styles, being the workers' homes and Luter Mansion, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but many people are not even aware that there is a Meadowville Village. That's so right. It's, a, it's an ongoing endeavor of the Side Heritage Foundation to try to make Exactly. So we're doing a fabulous job of that too. Historical villages are still remnants of those historical mm -hmm. villages. Are still and there are a lot of uh, older homes that have been retained that are also sitting in plazas like Cherry Hill House. You drive along and you see these houses from the late 1800s and they've been saved, but they look so out of place where they're located. But they are restaurants and such now. We have how many? Eight? No, we have 11. 11 now? 11 restaurants and that are buildings. Now some of them are, uh, some of them may not be fine restaurants in the sense that uh, they've gone through a number of owners and sometimes it's not always a sympathetic. That's right. Uh, dealing with it, they don't really necessarily promote history, but, mm -hmm. but others do. Uh, mm -hmm. The Barber House. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I went to Cherry Hill House a number of years ago and got this uh, menu. And when I got home, I was reading it, it's got the history in of the house. And darned if they hadn't plagiarized my write off from this book. I phoned up, phoned up Tom and said, What is this? I thought it looked familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it also has the errors in that I told you about. That's how we know they Nothing. Yeah. 
Uh, I, like, I love them so much I wasn't going to do anything. But you're quite welcome to come and browse here at the things I've laid out. So you're working on that? Me? Yeah. Well, I'm going to put my heart and soul into working with the library and getting the manuscript together and doing a few other projects. And uh, always something in the wind. <laughs> it might be of interest to some here uh, regarding the Cody situation. As you know, Cody originally donated the land for the little white church that you showed the exactly. uh, uh, cemetery on. Uh, visiting Death Valley in Northern uh, California, you go to Scottie's Castle, which is a fantastic castle you may have been there. And you come into one room and there is a huge painting of Bill Cody, Buffalo Bill. <laughs> Those people traveled thousands of miles on horseback. Here, a man that had his beginning here exactly. ends up in, in, uh, <laughs> I know. in Death Valley in California. <laughs> and he's a descendant of one of our own. He, he pretty well, uh, Buffalo Bill traveled with the Pony Express mm -hmm. all the way across the state, so he got everywhere. And um, really even uh, we even think that he might have come up here with uh, Bill Hickok in the 1870s. There was a, a story out that uh, um, that he was. Um, here and being baptized here and all that, but you can read it in the book, the, the true story of it. I don't know if some of you are aware, but um, when Square One first opened, we had a Buffalo Bill restaurant in there. Yes. And uh, so my son cleaned all the restaurants in there, and, yeah. and uh, I went over and spoke to the fella and found out uh, the information on Buffalo Bill because there were a lot of controversial stories. Um, and it's nice to get them straightened, straightened out and the real story come to the forefront rather than going through all of these um, things that aren't true. It's it's really difficult when you're doing research uh, to find the real story to all of these things. I appreciate you all coming and your questions and everything. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And I think that it's really good to know that there are still people like Kathleen that are taking this very seriously and still documenting the heritage of this area. If you're talking about the Canadian Rim, and Don, and Don's here as well, too, I was amazed to go in and again look at the scrapbooks in there of the slide collection that all the scrap took in the 70s, and there's some 20,000 slides in there, and you know they're from the 1970s. And you know something? They're historical slides, because there's hardly a building on the Dundas from the 1920s, or sorry, from the 1970s, and that streetscape that exists. Mm -hmm. You saw it tonight there, where Cherry Hill was, where it was moved to, they've entirely reconfigured Cawthra uh, Road. And one of the things that's happening here, and this is where I hope that some people can get involved too, is in dealing with the history of the last 40, 50, 60 years, which is something that we have lost. For a lot of things in these pictures here tonight that we didn't see, like Bruce McLaughlin standing over the old center court yeah, of square yes. one. It's only yeah, ten, it was yes. 10 years ago, but there, there are tons of people who don't even know that that ever existed. Yeah, exactly. um, so, you know, the history is very recent as well too and Kathleen provided us with all of these wonderful materials to make the overheads out of and uh, there they are there's this, there's this ancient history that's so modern but uh, we do have the uh, the the Albert's the, I don't know what you call them and he called them the Albert Sprouts graphics he actually was the one who got those going yeah, but that's a great idea yeah but the thing is it's 19, 1970s primarily and it goes on through the 80s and they become the historical document mm -hmm. for our children, my children, right now, mm -hmm. because these things did not exist. So it's an ongoing occupation. And, and as I mentioned, Kathleen is, is, uh, has been a tremendous historian of the 19th century, but also of the 1970s. Uh, I, I think you, th this is why I ask you this question, because you've been talking about your 150 interviews and perhaps the <laughs> publishing of 
interviews, Kathleen did with such prominent people that you may not know live in this community, like Colonel Harlan Saunders. Uh, and uh, Ray Swan, of course, and people like that, Tommy and Hunter. Mr. Tommy Hunter, and people like that who lived in this area at one time, too. So Kathleen is busy working on preserving that part of our heritage, which is quite modern. So it is continuing. That's the good news of Kathleen. Keep it up. Thank you. <laughs>